when we think of our gut, we think of our gut microbiome. And that's important, but what's possibly even more important is the actual gut itself. So when we talk about gut damaging foods, it's easy for us to think about the microbiome. And that's just, that's a wild world that we can't fully grasp yet, right? But the actual gut itself, what are foods that literally harm the junction proteins? So our gut is made up of these tight protein junctions. So it's basically cells that are wound really tightly together, but they're still permeable, right? So they allow nutrients and they allow fluids to pass through, hence why they're so fragile. When these proteins get disrupted, the junctions change and it allows for other things, allergens, things that shouldn't pass through, inflammatory things, all to pass through. That is true gut damage, not just damaging your microbiome. So we're gonna talk about the foods that cause this impact the most. And the first one is one that I hope people aren't really consuming a lot of anymore, and that's good old fashioned pudding cups. The reason that pudding cups are here is not because I'm an anti-pudding guy, it's because of something called polysorbate 80. And full disclosure here, a lot of the literature that we're looking at is going to be in vitro because it's very hard to look at the mucosal layer inside a human. So when I suggest these things, it's not things that you need to never ever eat again, but it's things to be conscious of based on preliminary research. So polysorbate 80 is an emulsifier, so it allows the fats and the water to kind of like blend, right? So that you can actually create, in this case, pudding. Now, what literature has suggested is quite daunting. There's a study published in Molecular Nutrition that found that just 0.2% polysorbate 80 ends up massively disrupting the proteins in the single layer. So essentially the single gut layer. So what they did in this case was they exposed these proteins to polysorbate 80 and they used a dye and they found that the dye was able to pass through the protein junctions after being exposed to polysorbate 80 but it wasn't able to pass through if not exposed to polysorbate 80. But what's even worse is it also reduced the expression of these junction proteins so it was in other words harder for the body to reproduce these proteins after the damage because it changed sort of the genetic aspect of it. This is a really big deal that we have to pay attention to. And now how this applies directly is in this case, they saw that allergens passed through easier. So maybe you don't have bad, like an intolerance to a food, but suddenly you started to develop an intolerance, right? You're like, hey, am I having allergic issues to this food? Well, maybe it's because allergens are able to pass through because there's gut mucosal damage. Now we move into the next one. The next one is specific to a lot of cakes and things like, it's a different kind of emulsifier. You wanna be careful with anything that has polysorbate 20 in it. Again, you're gonna see it in like the hostess type stuff, not to just like call out a brand, but those kinds of things, right? In this case, they saw that just 0.1% of polysorbate 20 caused intestinal cells, like these proteins and these cell junctions, to straight up burst. And they found that this was triggered by an inflammatory response that would occur that would essentially make it such a hostile environment that the cells would just burst. In this case, you have literal damage because the cells are dying. The next one is one that's gonna sound super daunting. The good news is there's a really simple solution for it, but there are increasing bodies of evidence that are suggesting that dishwasher detergents and rinse aids could be one of the worst things that we're just consistently exposed to. So there's a study in food allergy and gastrointestinal disease, and it demonstrated that when you wash dishes in a dishwasher, even the simplest dishwasher detergents have a little bit of a rinse aid in them. So after the cycle's done, there's a rinse aid residue that is left on the dishes. These are alcohol ethoxylates and they damage the actual structure of the cells. So they are literally cytotoxic. So they cause the cells to have a certain degree of damage. Now, in small amounts, it's not the end of the world, but it gets on our silverware and then we're taking bites and we're repeatedly exposed to this stuff, especially when you eat at restaurants and they're using particular rinse aids to make the glasses shiny and things like that. The whole reason it's shiny is because it's got basically a layer that's protecting it, while that same layer that protects glass is essentially destroying the gut, at least preliminary research is suggesting. But the literature also suggests that just rinsing your dishes before you use them gets rid of most of this. So just take your silverware, run it under some hot water before you use it, and it pretty much solves the issue. Now this video wouldn't be complete unless I raised some eyebrows and raised some concern by talking about diet sodas. Okay, 
I am not the kind of person that's gonna say never have a diet soda. Like when you look at the literature between sugar and artificial sweeteners, it's kind of a toss up. It's like pick your poison really, right? So there is some literature that suggests that diet sodas sure can affect the microbiome, but there's also some literature suggesting they affect the gut itself. And they look at this in a little bit more reasonable dosages. So a lot of the microbiome research is looking at astronomical amounts of aspartame, sucralose, saccharin. This particular study looking at the gut cells was looking at reasonable amounts that we would consume. So it was published in the journal Nutrients. And again, it was in vitro, so we can't 100% take it to the bank. But they looked at sucralose, saccharin, and aspartame and its effect on intestinal cells. They found that in low doses, aspartame and sucralose reduced what's called cloudin-3. This is a mucus secreting protein. So this is what actually produces the mucus that protects the gut. When you get a runny nose, it protects the membranes there and it helps flush things out. Same thing happens in our gut. We have a mucosal layer that protects. Well, looks like we decrease the proteins that secrete mucus. And then in high amounts, it actually caused full on apoptosis, full on caused the cells to just die. So does this mean don't drink diet soda? It means don't drink a few a day. Like if you're gonna have a Diet Coke, I don't think it's the end of the world. Okay, I know we know that aspartame is a class two carcinogen. It's not the end of the world. But again, really pick your battles here. Now, before I dive into talking a lot about this next one, which is trans fats, I need to help you understand something. Trans fats are probably the most unanimous food when it comes down to something that is bad for us, okay? It's something that just about everyone agrees with, right? It's bad for liver fat, it's bad for the gut mucosal layer, it's bad for the microbiome, it's literally just terrible, right? And it's been outlawed in the United States. But if you were to look at a label, you will still find trans fats, right? Because anything that says hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated has trans fats in it. All that they've done is limited the amount of trans fats that we can have per serving. So what do they do? They just decrease the serving size. So instead of having one serving of Doritos, you're having three servings of Doritos, right? So it's making it kind of like finding a loophole there. It's very, very frustrating. Now, people have damaged their guts a lot through trans fats and through a lot of things. I can't tell you that you can just restore your gut magically, but you can kind of restore some level of homeostasis. Now, you can skip over this part if you want, but I put a link down below for the Symbiotic, which is a prebiotic and probiotic that I recommend. Again, full disclaimer, they are a sponsor on this channel, but it doesn't have to do with this content per se. You can skip this if you want, but I do think if you're looking to remodel gut health and you're focused on your microbiome, it's a really good thing to look at. So it is a 25% off discount link for Seeds Daily Symbiotic. So again, this is a prebiotic capsule inside of a probiotic capsule. So it's a capsule inside of a capsule technology. So they fund a lot of the microbiome research that's going on. In fact, they're some of the ones that are looking into some of the rinse aid and dishwasher detergent studies that have nothing to do with the microbiome. It just literally has to do with the gut health itself. So you have a company that is paying attention to the microbiome as far as their product is concerned, but is actually conducting research on the full spectrum of gut health, not just things that serve them directly, which is pretty admirable in my opinion. So that link down below is for 25% off that symbiotic, which I highly recommend if you're trying to change your diet or trying to remodel your gut health. So that link is down below for that 25% off just beneath this video in the top line of the description. As far as trans fats, there was a study in Frontiers in Immunology that compared control mice to mice that were on a high fat, high sugar diet or a high trans fat and high sugar diet. Only the mice that had the high trans fat and sugar diet had significant degrees of intestinal inflammation. The sugar and fat diet definitely caused some, but nothing like the trans fats and sugar diet. So it's not just about the fats and sugar. It's about the type of fat and also the type of sugar. Now, I hope that you've been sticking with me through this because now we get to learn about something that might be worse than the diet soda, and that's literally drinking a regular soda. People always ask, if I were to compare diet soda to regular soda, like what's worse? I mean, again, 
pick your poison here, right? Well, there was a study that looked at sugar compared to other things when it came down to our gut. This was published in Disease Models and Mechanisms. It looked at high concentrations of sugar. It looked at titanium dioxide, which is definitely not good stuff, banned in the EU. It looked at something called tween, T-W-E-E-N, which is actually a pretty gnarly emulsifier. And then it looked at sodium chloride, which is basically just like table salt. What they found was pretty interesting. As far as gut damage, sugar, was by far the worst. So all these scary chemicals and straight up high concentrations of sugar caused the most intestinal permeability. They found that it decreased something called intestinal alkaline phosphatase, which is what's required for rebuilding the junctions in the first place. So there was less overall mucosal defense, less rebuilding of the protein junctions, and the most permeability. So it actually decreased the integrity of the gut the most. So when you ask yourself the question, hey, I'm craving a soda, but I don't wanna have diet soda, really ask yourself the question again. Like, first of all, do you need to have a soda in the first place? Can you just have water or something else? Or is it better for you maybe to just have half of a Diet Coke and call it a day instead of diving down sugar lane? Number seven is cigarettes. Now this is interesting because there was a study that took mice in a control setting versus mice where they were basically pumped in a room with smoke, where it was equivalent to about five cigarettes a day. What they found is that the cigarette smoke exposed mice had severe gut damage. They also had atrophy of the villi. So those are the little fingers that are in the intestine. Like if you look at a cross-sectional area of the intestines, you've got those little like fingers that go out. That's what absorb nutrients, right? It gives more surface area. If your intestines were just a smooth wall, that's not much surface area. But when you have it like this, that's a lot of surface area for nutrient absorption, right? But when you have atrophy of those, they're shorter, they're smaller, so less nutrient absorption just by smoking cigarettes. It's pretty wild. Now the next one is one that's gonna upset some people. It's MSG. Now there's a study in food science and human wellness, and it looked at varying concentrations of MSG, and it found that in low amounts, like the amount that you might have if you just ingested a tiny bit in a regular food, really not a whole lot of damage. But when you started getting up to the higher amounts, like a gram per kilogram, which is not something you'd consume, up, then there started to be serious gut protein junction damage. Now, no one's gonna go out and consume like 1,500 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, but there are a lot of cultures and a lot of people that are consuming upwards of 10 grams total. Like, so that's a pretty decent amount. Now, the tolerable upper intake that's been set out in the world is usually between six and eight grams per day. So that means there are a lot of people that are consuming a high amount of MSG, and this is happening daily. So a low dose MSG might not be a problem, but in high concentrations, we do have to question if this is something our body can really handle. Although the evidence isn't conclusive enough for me to say, hey, never go have some buffet food that has MSG, it does mean you probably shouldn't be eating frozen TV dinners every single night. And lastly, the one that's probably the biggest threat to us today is going to be BPAs. And there was a study published in Environmental Pollution. What they found is that in pretty high concentrations, BPAs definitely damaged the gut proteins. They damaged those cells. As a matter of fact, the study literally said that BPA, quote, destroys the structure of these epithelial cells. It really does break it down. But what we have to look at here is not just one bolus of BPAs. It's the fact that we are constantly exposed to these things. We're never gonna be able to get rid of exposure entirely. It's in our air, it's in everything, okay? But what we can do is make concerted efforts where we can. It doesn't mean never drink out of a plastic bottle. It doesn't mean never use a plastic bowl. It means, hey, where are the things that I can change easily? You have a Colgan water system at your house, it's in a plastic bottle, call them up and ask for the glass version. Like little things like that, if you can just reduce your exposure, because what we've seen with BPAs is that very clearly the dose makes the poison. And if you can just lessen the dose, it's less of the poison. So you don't need to be a freak and put yourself in like a magical tent that's protecting you from 5G, EMF, and BPAs, but you probably should say, hey, where can I simply reduce it? And how can I change how my household functions and sort of the micro environment that you live in? So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.